It's a platform powered by AI that tells you how your property could be impacted by climate change in the next, say, 10 to 20 years. It can also tell you when to sell and where maybe you want to buy next. All you need is your postal code. The AI is trained to do the rest. So, want to see how your home or investment property could be impacted by 2035 by global warming? Well, let's meet the man behind a, a platform that could future-proof real estate. Parakana is the author of Move, The Forces Uprooting Us, and since COVID, he's also learned a host of other skills that have contributed to the start of Climate Alpha. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be back with you again. Uh, fantastic to speak with you. So, tell us about Climate Alpha, will this future-proof real estate? That's very much the purpose. Let's bear in mind, let's set the stage here. Real estate, land, property is the single most valuable, the largest asset class in the world economy by far, Michelle, $350 trillion at least. However, ironically, it is the most stuck in place by definition, right? Yeah. It is immobile. <laughs> and therefore the most exposed to climate change. So the largest sector of the world economy is also the most exposed to accelerating climate change. And for de decades, if not centuries, people have assumed that real estate always goes up and to the right. Why? Because of urbanization, population growth, right? So we've just assumed that you will you are holding on to an appreciating asset. What if in many, many, many places that is no longer true? And what if places that have underperformed in the past are going to outperform because of being in better geographies and being better adapted to climate change? So to sort out that future, which will be very different from the past, we started Climate Alpha. So is it a software company? Is it a data vendor? Is it predictive software that is really going to benefit um, people who are in the insurance industry who want to figure out, you know, when it comes to real estate insurance, uh, which areas to insure, which natural disasters to include in coverage or not? What is Climate Alpha and which businesses could benefit from it? All of the above. Uh, we first and foremost started as a data science company because climate models are very non-linear, which is a fancy way of saying you can't predict exactly where the climate is going, right? Mm -hmm. And not only that, it's hard to predict what impact it will have on the ground. If you take two places where a climate model says there will be heat waves, there will be droughts, or there will be floods, or there will be sea level rise, that doesn't mean that both of them are going to collapse in value right? Because one of them may have seawalls, it may have great infrastructure, it may have a very wealthy population, it may have taken all kinds of measures to adapt, but maybe the other place didn't, mm -hmm. right? So one will actually appreciate, and the other will depreciate. So climate alone cannot answer it. So what you have to do is to take all of the climate models, but also all of the socioeconomic, fiscal, demographic, infrastructure, all of that other data, and blend it together. And that's why you need a data science platform, software, a neural networks, which is a branch of artificial intelligence, in order to train all of it to make those forecasts about locations. So fundamentally, it is AI-trained location analytics, bridging climate and economic factors together. And so who will use it? Of course, real estate investors, right? Land, property, infrastructure, all of those categories. It could be industrial, housing, commercial, um, energy, food, water, all of utilities, all of those things. And of course, insurance or those who are insured, which should be everyone, mm. because the insurance companies are using such models like ours to make decisions about whether they will or will not insure certain places in the future. So what are the data sets that you are using to tie climate change to real estate values? Right. So first on the climate side, actually, as you know, there's decades of research that's gone into this. You have the scientific community, the diplomatic community, academic institutions have assembled uh, what's, what are known as an ensemble of models, dozens and dozens of forecasts. And they relate to flooding, fire, heat, mm -hmm. drought, sea level rise, hurricanes, storms, all of these climate risks individually and collectively to build scenarios about what impact they will have uh, potentially on any coordinate in the world relative to the historical record, right? So in the past, temperatures were X. In the future, they might rise by one degree, two degrees, 1.5 degrees, right? Uh, and over what period of time? Mm -hmm. But that's you can't view these things in isolation. 
right? There's many different risks that are colliding with each other. And of course, we're seeing this in the news every single day. Then you also have to have the demographic data. Where are people going? What's the population density? What's the wealth? Where is the government investing? Where are corporates investing as well? And put all of that together. But all it all has to be geo referenced, right? Meaning what is the place where all of this is coming together and how does place X differ from place Y? But let's bear in mind, these are all relative performers, right? It's not just one place in isolation because if people move in the previous previous example I gave you, the place that is ill-prepared versus the places that is prepared, people will move towards more resilient locations and those places will outperform. We will guide investors mm. to invest in the places early to be a first mover in resilient geographies. Absolutely brilliant. So in terms of resilient zones, we were talking earlier about this Netflix series right. out in the blue zones. And I was so surprised to see Singapore came up as a blue zone. Um, where does Singapore stand in terms of your model of resilient areas? First up. Well, first of all, why were you surprised that <laughs> Singapore would have merged as a blue zone? We have uh, the highest life expectancy in the world alongside uh, the other blue zones, you know, Okinawa Island and one part of, uh, you know, southern Italy and Spain. So I think it's long overdue for Singapore to be recognized as a blue zone. I think all of us who are fortunate enough to live here know. Well, that I don't see is, a lot of 104 yeah. year olds walking around the way you do in Okinawa. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they may not be <laughs> dancing in the moonlight, but uh, but I think, you know, I think that series and all of the writing about what com what, what com comprises a blue zone uh, really hits home for those of us who live here, right? We know that we eat well, that we spend time outdoors, that we socialize and have, have you know, what's known as social fitness, right? All of those uh, attributes are in place. And then one other factor that we, of course, bring in is environmental resilience, right? Now, that may strike a lot of people as odd. And many people come to me and they say, wait a minute, you've started a climate finance, uh, you know, real estate forecasting company in Singapore? I say, you know, look around the world. It's not just a matter of latitude. You don't just look at Russia and say, oh, yes, now is a great time to be investing in Russia. I don't see many people doing that, right? A lot of people are leaving Russia. A lot of people are coming to Singapore. So what is what is what is the purpose? What is the point there? Well, just because we're on the equator, the truth is that in climate models, the conditions in equatorial latitudes don't change as rapidly as they do in other places. In other words, we're already accustomed to it being hot and humid. Is it actually going to get a lot? Lot more hot and a lot more humid than it already is? No, not relative to how much hotter it is getting in Norway or in Canada. Look at the rate of death from heat strokes in the northern latitudes, places that don't have air conditioning. Would you rather be in a country that has air conditioning, that's building seawalls, that's adapting to climate change, or a place that's not? And so Singapore is a blue zone in many senses of the term because it is a healthy society, a wealthy society, mm -hmm. and one that's investing well in advance to adapt to climate change. We, of course, do have the highest air conditioning penetration in the world. Mm -hmm. So if Singapore is doing so well, will I be able to type in my postal code and see how my property here is being affected at Climate Alpha? Well, here's the fascinating thing. You know, if you take a large country like the United States, where we run this model, America has 40,000 zip codes, postal codes. That's a very granular level of analysis. And it's essential to break it down that way because you don't have a national resilience strategy. In many ways, it's quite Darwinian, you might say. A lot of places are on their own. Some places are getting grants from the government. Some places are investing in adaptation. Mm. Some places are simply not. Many places are not. Furthermore, the entire country of the United States is actually very exposed to climate change. As we know, the western regions are experiencing a mega drought. The uh, tornado alley, as it's known, has become a giant tornado patch. You have rising sea levels. You have immense flooding. So it's a very rugged terrain and a very harsh geography for much of the country. As we speak, 70,000 people are stuck at Burning Man, <laughs> you may have heard, right? Because of a flooding in that desert area and they can't reach the highway to get out of that music festival. Festival. Now, Singapore is different because our resilience strategy is a national one. It's meant to not allow any particular area to be underprivileged, to be disenfranchised as a result. In other words, we're helping to make sure that the entire uh, property market, all of our infrastructure is well insulated, if you will, from mm -hmm. climate change. And we're doing a good job of that. Look at flood controls, look at uh, water irrigation channels and measures, all of these things that we're doing, coastal barriers, raising roads. So you should not have a situation where particular postal codes of Singapore are somehow, you know, again, um, 
massively distressed uh, instantly and dislocated as a result because we're protecting our island. Again, we have the luxury of doing so because we're a small country and we plan ahead. But other places, large countries are not so lucky. So I can't type in my postal code <laughs> here in Singapore and figure out how my property is going to do just yet. Or oh, are you expanding the models in Asia, climate alpha, in oh, terms of coverage? We, yeah, in terms of coverage of climate risk models, we cover the entire planet. And quite frankly, we're not the only ones who do that, you know, to be clear, right? There's many places you can go to find out what the heat, storm, flood, fire, risk, sea level exposure is for any terrestrial coordinate in the world. And we do that too. The difference is, does that alone tell you what's going to happen? And as we've been discussing, no, it does not. You must also know, are people moving there? Is there resilience? In, are there investments being made in the infrastructure? Yeah. Are there other coping mechanisms? Is this market, in other words, going to appreciate in a secular way mm -hmm. despite climate risk? And the answer, again, for all of Singapore is yes. So you can expect that... Uh, Climate change will have an impact on people wanting to come to Singapore, and chances are more people will want to come to Singapore. If you look at our neighborhood, our region, again, just look at relative performance. You have 5 billion people in greater Asia, as you and I have talked about in years past. As you know, that's uh, one of the geographical areas that I focus on so much. Now, which other place in this catchment area, this radius that encompasses most of the human species, is as prepared to weather climate shocks and to adapt as we are? The answer is not really not many, right? There are certain urban enclaves, certain geographies you can identify. I've written a lot about, you know, upper peninsula, Southeast Asia, right? And parts of Central Asia that will probably benefit geographically from climate change. But people are not going to pick up from uh, Singapore and move to Kazakhstan. But meanwhile, people are going to pick up from Jakarta and move here. In fact, they already are, of course, right? So Singapore remains a relatively attractive place. I'll give you another analogy. Just take uh, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. People say, look at this scorching desert. You know, how can this be the fastest growing city on the planet Earth, which in fact it is over the last uh, generation? And the reason, again, is air conditioning, adaptation, wealth, infrastructure, relative political stability, of course, as well, rule of law. Now, would you rather be in Yemen? Would you rather be in Iran, right, or, or Iraq? Or would you rather be in Dubai? So to understand the future, you don't look only at the negative dimensions of climate models. You look at the overall integrated performance of a place under stress. And Singapore has proven itself time and time again to perform very well under stress, whether that is geopolitical, economic, or otherwise. And so are other you know, I call them islands of stability. They may mm -hmm. or may not all the islands, but it does. It happens to be the case, mm -hmm. uh, as as I observed during COVID. Places like Japan or Taiwan, Singapore, New Zealand, Iceland, Malta, actually islands mm -hmm. that have open economies that invest in resilience. Uh, you know, have actually outperformed. So again, um, you don't need to specify your postal code for Singapore. <laughs> Singapore, thanks to our you know leadership, government foresight is going to be better adapted than pretty much, you know, most other places in the world. All right. Well, speaking of that part of the world, we were talking about a climate change conference that you'll be attending soon. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you going to be speaking at at COP? And how do you think Singapore, uh, how do you think how Singapore is doing is going to feed into the discussions mm -hmm. there? Well, the COP28 summit, much like its predecessors, again, continues to overemphasize mitigation. Mitigation means decarbonization, greening supply chains, um, uh, you know, reducing the uh, carbon footprint of yeah. our industries and real estate and so forth. That is extraordinarily important. But let's bear in mind that the emissions that are already baked into the atmosphere and the negative feedback loops that those have kicked off and the damage that has been done and will be done in terms of the accelerated incidents of tropical storms, cyclones, rising sea levels, that is baked in. That is irreversible. The climate is a complex system. It doesn't simply snap back to the perfect, predictable days of the 1950s or 60s just because we may be reducing emissions. So we have to do those things. And mitigation is what drives that agenda at these conferences. Our mission and our, um, you know, sort of talking point and the, the projects that we're working on focus on adaptation, right? I accepting the fact that climate change is real and accelerating, 
but promoting investments and adaptation. So that's going to be our big theme. Singapore, again, embodies that effort in addition to also working hard to decarbonize. And, you know, uh, whether it is GIC, Tomasek and others, there's a lot of investments that are going into net zero initiatives. Uh, Singapore is a leader uh, in in not only what we're doing domestically and what we've done to adapt. Look, think about uh, this resilience of Singapore's water supply and our growing self-sufficiency there. Look at the efforts around food production, alternative protein, uh, distributed energy systems, all of these things. So Singapore is doing a lot in our small use case of this country. But I would say that our environment minister, Grace Fu, is also a leader in areas like biodiversity and promoting uh, that on the global diplomatic agenda. So I think collectively, uh, there is a set of actors, whether it's our government, companies like mine, what we're trying to do is to promote adaptation investments to complement the mitigation ad agenda. And to be clear, this is what is being accepted around the world that you know you see this with each successive cop summit more and more people realize that simply calling to meet the paris agreement targets and reduce emissions that's fine but it isn't nearly enough it really is too late i think that we all have to really appreciate this and i think that it's actually unethical uh to be clear that when people focus only on reducing emissions and don't focus on the actual damage done, the lives lost and harmed every single day all over the world, and to put more investment into adaptation to help people's lives, it is unethical to ignore that and to focus only on reducing emissions. And so you're going to be launching a fund to do with adaptation? Absolutely right. Because we've seen that tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars are being committed, again, rightly towards mitigation and decarbonization. Mm. Where are the hundreds of billions and trillions, quite frankly, that need to go into adaptation, into water desalination projects, into renewable energy generation in, a, in, in remote locations, into building the infrastructure and housing that are gonna be needed in resilient geographies to absorb waves of migrants. Let's bear in mind that at the COP summit, you'll talk about you know, devoting money towards, um, you know, doing coastal mangrove projects or about, uh, again, adaptation policies and genetically modified seeds, drought resistant seeds for poor farmers in Africa. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, Africans uh, are marching northward and trying to cross the Mediterranean to move to Europe. So European countries, even though they're quote unquote rich, actually need a lot of support to adapt their geographies to absorb the growing populations of climate migrants. Absolutely. The same is true in the Western Hemisphere. Just look at the millions of people, again, not thousands, millions, who have, have, tried, have crossed the Atlantic Ocean from Africa to Latin America, and the Latin Americans moving through Central America, through Mexico, to cross the United States border. The number of illegal migrants, many of whom you could rightly classify as climate migrants, in addition to economic refugees, asylum seekers, and so forth, trying to enter the United States successfully. The number of illegal migrants in the United States, by some accounts, it's hard to know exactly, exceeds the number of legal migrants. And of course, the United States is already the largest recipient of legal migrants. The United States is also the largest recipient of climate refugees every single year, people from the Caribbean islands. So no matter how much we uh, invest in helping poor countries to adapt, it's still not enough. Actually, the resilient geographies of the world, the places that inevitably are going to gain in population because humans will flee distressed areas mm -hmm. and try to migrate to stable areas, they need help. They need So uh, we are launching a fund, the Fund for Adaptation and Resilience whose purpose is to support resilient geographies, uh, modernize their uh, agricultural systems to provide more food for the world. Look at the food stress. Russia invades Ukraine and suddenly the price of wheat goes through the roof. Well, why aren't we generating more supply of food, food staples in different locations uh, so that we don't so that we can have a resilient food supply? Yeah. Energy, water. All of those fundamentals, and again, the infrastructure needed to consider the mass relocation of people as climate change accelerates. As you know, that's a topic dear to, to my heart, and it's really the reason that I started the company in the first place. Which countries are covered in this fund? Well, it's really the whole world. I mean, so which areas? The way we think about the world, the political map. Right. In terms of, uh, you know, countries of North America and Europe and Asia and the Middle East and Africa. And then the way we classify them economically into developed markets and emerging markets and frontier markets. This is very neat, simple and misleading. Mm. Right. Because the truth is that we're moving into a world. I think we're already in a world where you cannot simply 
trust that your long-term capital, that your investment in a so-called developed country is going to have a stable you know, uh, a payout over time, a stable yield, simply because a ratings agency said that it's a good investment, right? In truth, you have to bring in the climate layer and say, is this a climate resilient geography or not? So our fund will target climate resilient geographies. And that is actually a global uh, phenomenon because it's about helping places to adapt. So it could be parts of the Middle East. It could be parts of Central Asia. It could be parts of East Asia, obviously, as well, our own region here. So we want to invest in fortifying and improving the resilience of these geographies, wherever they may be. And that may even include, quote unquote, wealthy countries. I'm fascinated by your platform, Climate Alpha. And this concept of neural networks. Now, talk to us about the algorithm, because we know, you know some data sets, when we talk about neutrality, not all data is neutral. Um, again, help us understand the data sets, how it feeds into the predictive nature of your model, and how neural network comes into the picture of turning climate risks into opportunity. Mm -hmm. Data science is essential here because, first of all, you have a very nonlinear phenomenon, right? You can't really just paint, and you see this very often with climate forecasts. It says, you know, by 2100, temperatures may rise 2 degrees Celsius, and you'll see a chart that shows a gentle slope in the increase in temperature and rainfall. Of course, look at the real world, and what you see is a lot of volatility, right? Temperatures skyrocketing very, very fast, but then the next year may be a little cooler, and then it goes up again, and so forth. So very jagged. So machine learning models help to capture on an ongoing basis, that volatility, and turn that into a more accurate forecast so that you don't just have a gentle predictive slope because the world doesn't work in that gentle way. So that's one example of how data science works. The other is, again, you're blending things that do that you can historically backtest. You can historically backtest for the impact or the correlation of population density to property value right? Or wealth to property value or education levels to property value and all of those kinds of things. But can you back test for um, the change in the amount of rainfall in the location, right? Or the number of hot days in a location? Well, no, we haven't historically captured that because the change was not significant anyway. So how do you take things that you cannot historically test for right. and yet still project their future impact financially? And that's what we use such models for, to enable, I don't want to say predictive power as if you're putting an exact number on it, but we are, but generating a range of forecasts, right? A probabilistic distribution of, of, of outcomes are mm -hmm. the forecasts that we generate so that you can make a, a, a considered investment decision despite not knowing exactly what the climate is going to be. I'm glad we're ending on this note. We have about 60 seconds on the clock, uh, Parag. What advice would you give listeners out there thinking about making investment decisions potentially influenced by climate risk? Well, let's bear in mind that we're, again, very fortunate to be in Singapore. Don't just look at these climate models alone that obviously paint the whole world, really, much of it, but flashing bright, bright red. Uh, of course, that includes us and other places, but emphasize adaptation and Singapore is doing the right things. So support the government, get educated, think about what the role of investors and, and, and innovators is in ensuring that Singapore is a leader in adaptation as we are. What, what does that mean for our neighbors and how do we help those countries as well? And that's something that we're doing institutionally, but we need to get involved. But Singapore is a hub for global investment. So whether it is at the level of our sovereign wealth funds or whether it's family offices and retail investors who are investing in property and REITs, uh, you know, holiday homes, whatever the case may be around the world, you know, look at the look at the profile of those locations and in, in, in the comprehensive way that we do and project where your best investment is going to be five, 10 years out, because climate is no longer something that people say, oh, that's a 20 year issue. Right. It's already now. It's here. It's going to affect, you, you know, it. where you buy. And remember that even if you feel that your investment is stable, that you're holding on to, are you going to have a buyer five years from now or 10 years from now? So you need to factor all of those things in today. He is founder and CEO of Climate Alpha and founder and managing partner of Future Map Parakana. Thank you so much for coming by. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Money FM 89.3.